Thank you very much. Yes, in a, in a session uh, surrounding data management, I, I'm going to start with uh, telling you why I got into this. And I've been involved with this national facility for about 20 odd years. So uh, we collect data on behalf of others, whether that be structure factors and handing them out or, or completed SIFs. And therefore, I feel we have a duty of care. Uh, in terms of managing that data responsibly and appropriately. Uh, and that so that's, sort of underpins absolutely everything we do. But uh, this first cropped up and whacked me in the face, if you like, when I had to move this centre from Wales to the south of England, uh, about a hundred and odd miles down the road. And we did that. We didn't get in Pickford's moving people. I did it in a transit van myself. Uh, and we've been running this national facility for quite some time in that place. And so in physically shifting the laboratory, I discovered a lot of skeletons, an awful lot of skeletons. And they uh, came in magnetic tape form, in magnetic disc form. Uh, they came in paper form, line printouts, filing cabinets full of these things. I even uncovered punch cards. Uh, and that move happened in 1998. And I've only just finished now trying to claw back uh, and, and save uh, some of the data that was actually held on those sort of obsolete media. Uh, that, that's been a very sort of thought-provoking uh, exercise. And of course, since that period in 98, uh, we've, as we've seen from previous talks, uh, detection rates, computing <coughs> power, uh, speed uh, have all increased, uh, and, and that's leading to what we currently call the data explosion. But actually, we've had a lot of data around that we've needed to manage for for many, many decades. Uh, and so uh, that's why I got into this. But in a data management session, uh, I, I, I feel I need to actually uh, talk a bit more broadly. And I think that's what I'm, I'm here about, to talk about. Uh, and so when we talk about data management, to the practicing crystallographer, uh, most of them think about the, the problems of day-to-day uh, -day coping with a, with a deluge of information. How do I audit this? How do I find the thing that I did two, three, four years ago? Uh, someone's come to me to write up a paper. Where's all the stuff? Uh, that kind of thing. And it's sort of the day-to-day -day auditing of what we do. Uh, but actually, uh, more importantly, are aspects of scientific uh, responsibility. Uh, is the work that we do re uh, reproducible? Uh, have we recorded accurately? Have we archived uh, accurately? And, and can we actually enable uh, the results of what we do to be incorporated into future and drive future science. This is really, really rather important. And, but also, these days, uh, diversity is kind of important. And by that, I mean interdisciplinarity. I'm not entirely sure what my small molecule crystal structures are actually going to uh, be incorporated into or what studies they're going to be uh, contributing to when they go out there in the big wide world. Uh, but also in terms of actually collecting the data. So uh, I run a mid-range facility. It operates out of a university laboratory. It's very high-powered equipment. Uh, we interact with people who have looked at some of, the, uh, some of this, uh, these samples or related samples on their, on their home laboratory sources, micro-sources, what have you. Uh, and we have access to synchrotrons. So we sit in the middle of a whole spectrum uh, of different kind of ways of collecting data and different, uh, what I call here, institutional boundaries. And there's also issues about accountability. Uh, telling our funders how much, we've, how much work we've done, uh, being able to, uh, to adhere to mandates for openness uh, and, data man and, and rigorous data management uh, are all part of that. Uh, very quickly, uh, what construction, we have to actually think about what structures are going to be used for in the future, or not necessarily think about it, but uh, protect against it, guard against it, and uh, make sure our data is available so that they can be uh, incorporated into uh, broader scientific studies. So we're not just doing crystal structure for the sake of uh, analysing a crystal structure. It's going to go out there and be used uh, in, in the broader spectrum of things. And, and that's what I really want to talk about, is the context of the crystal structure in the, in the broader scientific uh, landscape, if you like. And that's really the essence of my, my talk. Uh, and therefore, to enable that, good crystallographic practice um, requires recording... Uh, of information that goes beyond the, the current uh, remit of the SIF. And that's the bottom line is, you do not know how your data is going to be used by other people when it's published and, and it goes out there. Uh, 
there, there are many, many uh, examples of this. But in terms of the data deluge, uh, and just simply thinking about chemical crystallography, uh, we uh, just simply looking at pure crystallographic data uh, and, con and studies that incorporate just crystallographic data, we are getting more and more complicated. So uh, in our research uh, in Southampton, we generate large systematic uh, series of compounds. We try and, uh, thorough crystallization screens uh, and attempt to collect uh, crystal structures of everything that comes out. So we have these sort of matrices of crystal structures. Every dot on this diagram, if you like, is a crystal structure. Uh, there can be many polymorphic forms of, of each of these uh, elements in the matrix. So we have studies which incorporate 250, 300 crystal structures in one go. And we try and make rules, you know, derive rules out of that uh, and look at, for patterns in packing and the likes. Uh, and we're now beginning to go beyond that and say, well, okay, uh, can, we, can we adopt this approach with all the data that's out there? Can we mine the CSD? Can we uh, pull in uh, chemistry from elsewhere? And therefore, we need to be able to, to do that. Very briefly, this kind of charts the process of doing scientific research. It's not a diagram I want to go into any detail in, uh, but the point is uh, that various different uh, parts of this process are covered by uh, different standards, different ways of going about things, and different ways of managing data, and that can lead to a big issue when it comes to uh, interoperability, compatibility, and trying to cover the whole cycle, if you like. So there are a number of ways in which we can, uh, we can manage electronic data, uh, starting from the top here, there are sort of repositories like, uh, like the CSD, if you like, uh, where final results data can reside. Uh, there's systems that we use in our own laboratories to be able to collect, uh, coordinate and manage data. Uh, and what I'll go on to call later on my talk, uh, structured data, data that we, we, we understand the form of, we understand the provenance where it's come from, generally stuff streaming off instruments, uh, and we can very easily structure and catalogue that data uh, and, and put it into these kind of systems. I'm also going to talk about all the stuff that supports all this experiment, that, you know, what we do in our, our lab notebooks, all the things that we can't easily capture uh, streaming off an, a machine, you know, the stuff that people do, uh, and that's, that comes from electronic lab, lab notebooks. And there's all these big data stores that we're quite familiar with. But the biggest problem uh, is the fact that everything I do probably goes through this thing. And if I dropped it off the side of the desk here, uh, I, I could be in a problem uh, situation. And so we use these devices uh, to control the management or even to be the management uh, of much of the, of the work we do. And increasingly, these mobile things are uh, kind of confusing the situation as well. And, and how do we actually get all these talking to each other? Uh, so firstly, I'll address what I call this structured data, which is mainly stuff streaming off, uh, off machines. And I'll draw on uh, what we have to do in the national facility. Uh, so we, as part of the national facility, we process about uh, 1,600 to 2,000 uh, data sets uh, per annum, uh, and that mounts up, and that comes from 100 odd different people around the country. So we have a lot to coming at us that we have to process and deal with, uh, and we need to underpin the whole life cycle. So we start with uh, proposals to use the facility, and that is where we get the very beginning of the context for doing, the driving force for doing this work. Uh, so when I, when I track back in five years in the future, I think, oh, this crystal structure that I want to publish has been orphaned. Uh, what is the scientific context? I've actually got the driving force, the reason, the scientific program under which uh, these people are actually trying to do the work. So it is actually pretty important to, to capture all that. And if you, if you don't, we're lucky that we have this kind of system and this sort of process that people have to apply to users. If you don't have that, you end up with orphaned data and you have absolutely no idea of its context. So grabbing from the originator of your samples, the reason behind, the rationale, scientific rationale behind doing this work is really, really important. And then we do a, a whole load of uh, peer review and approval and all that kind of stuff. So we developed a system to, to manage all that and I have to chart all that. That's not so interesting. But then we get to uh, somebody actually sending us stuff uh, and, and recording uh, what, uh, what, what somebody's done, uh, what they think they're submitting to us. 
Uh, this stuff that you're not really able to, uh, meant to be able to read is all about safety information, how one's meant to handle this sample. Uh, and, of course, as I said earlier, we follow on to the synchrotron, so we have to actually be very wary uh, of what we're taking on site to synchrotrons and, uh, uh, and how we're handling it all. So we've got to grab all this ancillary information uh, about the material that we're handling and uh, to enable us to go on to do the experiment. And of course, so, so this is going, stepping through our interface right now. This is a part of the experiment which I'm going to come to uh, a little bit further down the line in the talk. It's how you start to manipulate uh, and play around and, and uh, screen samples. And in chemical crystallography, this is uh, not really very well captured and documented. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of samples that uh, users uh, provide us with, uh, and we select one and, and head off down the route of doing the experiment. And this is where we get uh, really important information on individual samples, the reaction scheme uh, and the expected product, all the solvents that were used in, in synthesizing this and preparing it, etc. And we do a whole bunch of stuff in the lab, which is very structured information. Uh, it's all captured very accurately by the computers that drive our diffractometers, uh, and we have systems that we use on our, lap, on, on our PCs uh, that, that work up uh, the results, if you like. So at the top here, uh, so this is, this is how we store all our results information. Uh, this can be a publishing platform. I call it publication, but uh, we can publish to ourselves or publish just to our users or publish to the entire world through the system. So we store everything uh, in, a, in a very structured uh, repository, all the files that we generate are along the way of the analysis and routes into the diffraction data in underlying data stores. Uh, but this provides us and our users with a very sort of accurate summary report and it sits there uh, until we decide uh, that we want to make it available to, to the big wide world. So we have policies with our users that say, you know, after three years we're going to make this public if you don't come back to us and say why you don't want it made public or uh, whether you're going to publish or not. And so, so we implement policies that uh, will enable us to, to effectively make all the stuff we do uh, publicly available one way or other ultimately. But we have to come back to this and it's important that we have the whole accurate record uh, so that we can basically publish it. So talking briefly now here about uh, management across facilities. Uh, we sit here in, uh, in the middle of all this, so I've shown this cycle is in what we've just gone around in, in our facility, but we of course have to mesh in with what people do in their home institutions. Uh, some of our users uh, are crystallographers who, uh, who need access to higher powered instrumentation than they, they can currently they have in their the laboratory to address the problem they're looking at, uh, and some don't have any diffraction facilities available to them at all. Uh, but we want to grab as much information as they have uh, at the point around about here uh, where they submit into our system. But more importantly, we interface with central facilities, so we have very periodic, regular uh, beam time at Diamond, uh, and the number of samples that we're processing, we don't want to have to be able to have to uh, manually uh, uh, put them through the, uh, the processes of getting them to the synchrotron and processing that at the synchrotron. So we look at interfacing to the systems for management uh, that the synchrotron have, I'm not going to go into any great detail on this because Erica will talk about it in much more detail and I'm not experienced enough. But the bottom line is we need to do mapping between what we do in our local facility uh, and what the synchrotron does. Uh, and so uh, we, we had projects where we've uh, interfaced between the two and, and this core scientific metadata schema is basically uh, the way we go about this uh, or, or what we have to map onto. And so we're mindful of what we're doing, uh, joining up very well with what the, the, what's happening at the synchrotron. And so uh, I alluded to the fact that when we start doing an experiment in the laboratory, uh, it's, it's not very well documented. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, unstructured information, stuff, things, things that we need to record uh, for the, sci the scientific record that aren't <coughs> captured by machines. And by that... I mean, when you pour something out the sample pot and start poking around uh, underneath the microscope. Uh, and so we started developing in, into our system ways in which we can try and start to capture that information. And there's actually um, mobile technology that's kind of enabled us to do this. So we, we basically go around the lab 
capturing images with our mobile phones and, and uploading them to the system as part of the record. Uh, and we have to think quite a lot about sort of uh, the information or the, the evidence we present back to the people who submit to us, cause, because they're not just down the corridor, uh, they're from, from miles away, uh, and they send stuff to us by post. So we use... Uh, software that natively sits on devices like our mobile phones to capture things like uh, the sample as it's sent to us. Was it all, was it, did it arrive smashed up? Uh, we can, uh, <laughs> we can uh, back up uh, you know, uh, the way we've been working. Um, but also, you know, was there mother liquor in the pot? How much sample was in there? That kind of thing uh, affects the analysis further downstream. Uh, and so we take images and we can add notes on our mobile phones and then uh, upload it to our system. Uh, and we do a whole bunch of that for uh, how we manipulate the bulk sample and the crystal that we select. I mean, how many of us report um, the fact that we've derived a crystal structure from a block when actually much earlier down the process you chisel that off the end of a, a big rod uh, and it's not actually uh, representative of the, the shape of the bulk sample. Uh, and... That now becomes very important. We try and mine as many sources as we can to look at crystal form, uh, and I can't rely on any of them, to be honest. And I know that because I do it. <laughs> you know, we've, we've all chiselled a bit of a plate and called it, uh, called it a block or what have you. Uh, so very accurate uh, recording of, uh, of how you manipulate your sample, what actually ends up on the diffractometer, and, and trial uh, screens of diffraction uh, are, are all important. Uh, and that can all be uh, then uploaded into our management system and forms a report of this part of the process, which is rather more nebulous to try and capture. And we actually just do that through native browsers, so we, we don't worry about uh, writing apps. It all kind of works just through the browser on the phone. But what I want to talk a bit more about is unstructured data, uh, and in particular, lab notebooks. So we all make records in the lab uh, of what we're up to uh, and actually as a chemical crystallographer I need to integrate in with what uh, people are doing uh, in the synthesis labs. Uh, not a new problem. Faraday was a, a bit of a fan of mine. You can't read what it says here but he basically did 30,000 experiments. He catalogued them all in lab notebooks uh, and invented his own way of indexing them and being able to retrieve information about them. And this was also a record of the things that didn't work as much as the things that did work. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time uh, building a lab notebook. Um, it's open to all and we've spent the last year or two putting it on a cloud platform so we can make it available uh, to the UK higher education community. It's a very generic lab notebook, unlike the specific ones uh, that are sold uh, to, to chemists in industry. Uh, and so it can be used across disciplines. This is uh, engineering, environmental science. This is somebody uh, noting their, uh, their MATLAB code. Uh, this is instruments automatically logging into lab notebooks. And um, this is uh, sort of discussions of stuff that we did on the instrument. Or instru uh, so this, this group actually uses a lab notebook as a way of coordinating their weekly meetings and, uh, and what we've done in the, in the lab. Biochemical uh, assays open source science projects, so this is basically putting your lab notebook up there live as you're doing the experiments. It's funded by the Gates Foundation uh, and everyone around the world is uh, basically uh, trying experiments and, uh, and putting other results up online as they're doing them. Uh, but we use it to actually support basically the, the publication of chemistry uh, as a whole. So uh, in these lab notebooks alongside stuff about single crystals work uh, is the spectroscopy, uh, etc. Now, Lois is looming, so I'm going to whiz through this. We try and impose a, a bit of structure on all this data um, with uh, some ontology work that we've done. I won't go into it, but uh, we try and capture what we plan to do, what we actually do, and then compare the two things. Uh, and this is basically one of those plans for a single crystal diffraction experiment, and we can impose that, uh, we can expose that in a machine-readable way through our our data repositories. So machines can now come along uh, and look at all the files you've got and work out which ones were generated from each other and, and walk through the experiment. Uh, some slides now just about uh, what we're doing currently and, and, and the way I see the future. We want to integrate the crystal structures and the chemistry that they're doing um, with structure, as in 2D structure, uh, 
of, of compounds, their properties, etc., and be able to sort of do real informatics mining on what's out there. We're working with the Royal Society of Chemistry, Chem Spider, and have basically uh, underpinned, underwired uh, their database of uh, hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds with this same machine readable format. So we're now working on how we can uh, match up what we have in our crystal structure repositories with what's in compound databases that are online. And this is supporting publication. So uh, this is basically a, 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 an article that's about to come out uh, where all the electronic supplementary information for all the chemistry in the article is basically just hooking into our electronic lab notebooks. Uh, a bit of evidence of that there. We're registering all this with DOI. It's really, really very important to uh, go through um, registration authorities. So all our crystal structure stuff has got DOIs. Uh, for data, uh, we have a sort of institutional way of doing this, and all the lab notebook stuff that we publish, we register with DOIs as well, so it's all findable. Uh, and in collaboration with Rigaki, uh, we're looking at sample information management uh, going beyond what we do in the diffraction lab and pulling all this together, uh, where SIF is sort of at the core of it all, uh, but we've sort of extended around the SIF, and we're doing similar stuff uh, with... Uh, electronic lab notebook records as well. Sorry for running over time. This, is my, this mess is my attempt at uh, thanking all the people that have been involved over the years. It's sort of a way of, I'm trying to do wordles but with logos. It hasn't quite worked. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, scale is not a factor here. The JISC one would be huge. <laughs>